online at nhpr.org. From New Hampshire Public Radio, I'm Peter Biello, and it's time to do the Roundup. The Conval School District sues the state, claiming it has not provided an adequate education. The House and Senate vote for a $12 minimum wage, but disagree on the details of the tipped wage. And 2020 presidential candidates will be in New Hampshire this week. And it's Sunshine Week, a time to recognize the stories that emerge from open records requests. These and other stories made headlines this week. We'll talk about them in this hour. Give us a call, 1-800-892-6477. That's 1-800-892-NHPR. You can also send an email to exchange at nhpr.org or post on our Facebook page at NHPR Exchange. That's all one word. We are also broadcasting a live video of this radio show. You can watch it at the Facebook page. Again, search for NHPR Exchange. You'll find it there. And here to talk about the week's news and answer your questions are Dean Spiliotis, civic scholar in the School of Arts and Sciences at SNHU, Trent Spinner, executive editor for The Union Leader and New Hampshire Sunday News, and NHPR reporter Robert Garova. Thank you very much, everybody, for being here. Of course. Hey, Peter. Thank you. Again, listeners, the phone number for you to join the conversation, one 800 892-6477. Lots to talk about today. And we'll start with uh, that Conval lawsuit. Uh, The Conval School District has sued the state of New Hampshire as well as the Department of Education, Governor Chris Sununu, and Education Commissioner Frank Edelblut-Dean. The district's alleging essentially that uh, the state has failed in its uh, constitutional obligation. Yes, this goes all the way back to uh, 1997 and the New Hampshire Supreme Court uh, uh, decision, uh, widely known as the Claremont decision, which said that the state had a constitutional obligation to provide uh, adequate funding to public schools. And the contention here is that relying on property taxes is not sufficient, that property poor towns uh, are at a disadvantage to property rich towns. And so this has been playing out now for over 20 years, although my understanding is that the individuals behind the Claremont decision Andrew Valinsky, the executive counsel, and others are not necessarily the the same individuals pursuing this lawsuit. Uh, But nonetheless, the argument is that uh, the state is just not fulfilling its obligation. And uh, by by example, right now, the state pays about... uh, little over $3,600 uh, per pupil, and, and uh, I think that they, they said that the cost per student at the school is something more in the, in the order of 18000 So uh, there's just, it just a concern that the state is not sufficiently funding education here. Trent. What's happening here is the Conval School District is pressuring state officials to take action. They are fed up with waiting. Um, even one of the, the, uh, the vice chairman of the school board said, we're unwilling to keep waiting. So they're trying to make this process go faster. The legislature has not been able to figure out a solution. Just to kind of give you perspective of what happens here, um, uh, there are are property rich towns which are able to support their uh, students. They're able to you know, spend eighteen thousand dollars, twenty one, twenty four thousand dollars per student, and then there are property poor towns. Peterborough and and the Conval Regional School District spends eighteen thousand. Uh, Manchester spends about fifteen thousand, and then there are towns below that: Claremont, Franklin. And what the Supreme Court said was that it doesn't matter what town you live in; you have to get the state has a constitutional responsibility to give you an adequate education. And so they have been trying to figure out the formula where. Should property rich towns uh, send money to property poor towns after filtering it through the state? What exact how how exactly that process should happen? And what Peterborough is saying here is we're done waiting. Uh, we want our money. So when we hear about things like stabilization grants, that was one attempt to sort of rectify this issue, but that didn't really pan out the way legislators had hoped. Yes, that didn't pan out the way legislators had hoped. The Supreme Court basically threw this back on the legislature and said, you need to, you need to come up with a, with a sustainable plan. You need to do an overhaul of the way the system works. But getting Republicans and Democrats in Concord to agree on what that looks like, to agree on how much money should be going to public schools, how much money should be going to charter schools, that is the problem. I mean, it's, and, and with the legislature turning over every two years, it's hard to find a group of people. It's hard to find that consensus on how we do, how the state does this. And, and building aid has been another issue. The, the Governor Sununu and the legislature are, are now trying to channel more uh, more money to that. But yeah, basically the, it's been, <clears throat> I'm thinking in my head, going back to, to, to John Lynch and even Gene Shaheen and the, the, the number of years now that we've been debating uh, this issue of adequacy and the state's role in providing 
testing adequacy and various attempts to, to make up some of the difference. Uh, Trent mentioned donor towns, the property rich towns. Uh, yeah, so it, it basically is an attempt to, uh, to to push the issue a little bit harder than it's been pushed in recent years. And so is this really a surprise? I mean, we, we, we talk about it being sort of, wow, no one was expecting Conval to do this, but could we have reasonably expected a lawsuit like this to pop up at some point, given how discontent some some towns were with the with the funding formula? Absolutely. Yeah. And I wouldn't be surprised to see. I mean, what happened last time was other towns jumped in mm -hmm. and then property rich towns, donor towns jumped in on the other side of it. So there's the potential for a very long uh, court case here. Uh, it, there was an interesting quote from the governor, Chris Sununu. He says, as history has shown, the only people who win in these lawsuits are the lawyers and the problem never gets solved. Uh, and so that's what I think the school districts are, this, this school district is trying to do. Uh, but there's a long way to go. And so how far reaching would a decision on this case be? Would it force the state's hand and, and really change things for the better? The people say that the 1997 decision should have, should have done that, have done that. Yeah. <laughs> and we're 20 years into it. Yeah. OK. So uh, one source for Sarah Gibson's story about this on, on an HPR uh, argued that, um, you know, the lawsuit was needed, some say, but the timing isn't great because now maybe lawmakers will sort of lose the incentive to actually legislate a solution to this. Dean, does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of talk that uh, uh, the legislature and both and Governor Sunu and the legislature have recognized the need to, to ramp up uh, funding in a way. I think they're, they're slowing down the, the uh, stabilization grants were being phased out, and I think they've put a stop to the phase out. They're talking about giving more money uh, for uh, for building aid now as well. Um, but, you know, you, you, you think about the amount of money I mentioned earlier. I think they're going to go up to about 3700 per pupil, yet these costs can range anywhere from 18, 20, 22,000. Uh, there needs to be a more more, more systematic attempt to, to channel money to the schools. But uh, as Trent also mentioned, you know, this tends to get bogged down in the differences between towns and uh, the, pri the whole issue of, well, if public schools get a certain benefit, what about private schools? And uh, that can add to ad lead to additional lawsuits, et cetera. So it's, it's, there's a reason why I think this has dragged on for, for, for 20 years. And, I, and I'm not surprised to see it go back into the courts. One of the things we're going to be looking for as we do reporting on this subject is how the cha the makeup of the Supreme Court could potentially uh, be different here. The Supreme Court, and, and we could talk about this for for the for an hour. It's so complicated. But the Supreme Court basically said we don't want to take on the responsibility of figuring out the adequacy education funding. Uh, that's really up to the legislature. But I wonder if the the makeup of the court, and I think there's potential for the court to change a little bit more uh, as Justice Lynch. Uh, uh, reaches retirement age, I wonder if uh, that makeup will change the outcome of this case. And I wonder if a new court uh, will potentially look at it differently. Listeners, give us a call if you have a question or comment about this. 1-800-892-6477. Let's go to Tim and Rye. Tim, thanks very much for calling. You're on the air. Good morning. Thanks for taking my call. So I'm 66. I've been around New Hampshire a long time. I remember the Claremont decision, and I'm also a selectman in my little hill town, and I'm not calling, I must, I don't live in Rye, and there's a lot of pressure on property taxes, and uh, <clears throat> people in the municipal end of it here all the complaining, and here's what I tell people, I say, the problem lies in Concord, New Hampshire, with our state legislature, who won't enact additional sources of revenue. We have this horrible, horrible inequality and a perverse system where we send some of our property taxes to the state and then the state sends us some back. Well, it all boils down to this little antidote that I have. 30 years ago, my mom was in the state legislature. She was a representative from Hampton. And she told me, she said, Tim, New Hampshire ranks 49th, only behind Mississippi, in state aid to education. And guess what? 30 years later, we've only advanced three or four places. We have great education in the state. I just saw a graph yesterday. We're in, as of in, from 1913, I mean um, 2013, we're only behind Massachusetts and Maryland in the quality of our public education. But it's all on the back of the taxpayers. And, and so, Tim, you, you, Tim, if I could interrupt you for just a second. So it seems like you're saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, that, that the legislature needs to act and maybe not the courts. Is that what you're saying? 
Well, the courts are end, going to end up t- telling the legislature that the state of New Hampshire does not provide adequate funding for public education. That's what's going to come down to. Here's the thing. I, I texted Molly Kelly when she ran for uh, governor last year, and I was disappointed in her answer. I asked her, one of the questions I asked her was, are, are, what about a, a broad-based tax in the future of New Hampshire? And she said, sorry, can't sign on to that. I, I've take, I'm taking the pledge. Mm-hmm. Well, this is absolute insanity, and we're talking around it, and we're talking about our, the courts and court decisions, and what we need is a broad Base tax. It's not fair. Uh, All right, Tim. Well, hold on. I'm going to put it to our panelists, but I appreciate your call, Tim. Thanks very much. Uh, So, uh, Dean, your thoughts on Tim's? Yeah, it's very, very interesting. I was actually waiting to see if the caller was going to get to it in the end, but as I was listening to him, I was thinking, well, the subtext here that I often hear with this kind of a complaint is that there should be a statewide income tax or some sort Mm -hmm. of statewide tax. And as you heard, he got to it towards the end of his call. And uh, you know, we know how that plays politically in the state, and uh, uh, there occasionally uh, it, it, it pops up, particularly among progressives, but uh, uh, it has not worked well for, for candidates who have run for statewide office. So so a, a lot of folks who are unhappy with this method of funding with property taxes, et cetera, uh, in the end come around to this idea of some kind of broad-based tax, probably an income tax, and it's just a very difficult political sell especially with a Republican governor who's yeah. just not going to go for it. Yeah, um, the, the state's always tried to come up with creative ways to pay for things in the absence of a broad-based tax. And one way, for example, uh, that we should talk about that the state tried to pay for full-day kindergarten was uh, legalizing the, the, on, the, not online, the electronic gambling game Kino. And so uh, recently uh, the New Hampshire Senate voted to delink Kino funds from full day kindergarten and ex- instead fund full day kindergarten with state funds. Uh, Trent, how significant is this move? Very significant. Mm-hmm. The deal was we're going to take Kino, we're going to allow Kino in uh, restaurants and bars, um, but in exchange, uh, and in exchange, we're going to take that revenue and we're going to use just that revenue to pay for full day kindergarten. That mm-hmm. was the deal. Uh, that was a deal that Republicans crafted, and now the Democrats are in control of the legislature. What they're saying is that deal uh, is no longer valid. We would like to uh, put full day kindergarten into the regular budget. And so we would like to uh, make sure that we have enough money to fund it. Um, the original deal was whatever revenue we get from Kino, that's how, that's how much we're going to uh, fund it, fund full day kindergarten. Um, there was about eight and a half million dollars in, in – uh, Sorry, that was that was the goal was to raise about eight and a half million dollars, and it's fallen really short. It's fallen way, way short, short a couple million. because oh. a number of towns did not sign up: Portsmouth and Concord. Uh, a number of towns. It, it's taken a while. Um, it's always interesting to go into. Like I was in a bowling alley in Manchester the other day, and there was a Kino machine kind of hidden behind by the bathrooms, hmm. and no one was playing. And I think, uh, you know, there, there are some other places. I think Billy's Sports Bar in Manchester is the number one keynote yeah. spot in the... I've been to a couple of places, you know, restaurants and pubs where there are screens everywhere and every table has the stuff you can fill out. I don't have a sense of how many people are actually playing, but it was very visible in these particular establishments. I've been to places like Billy's where there are people, where <laughs> people are really playing, but then I've, you know, that bowling alley, it just seemed so out of place and it wasn't prominently featured and there were all these people with their families there and no one was playing Kino. So I, I think there are there are reasons, um, not just the you know big towns not not being part of it, but I think there are other reasons too that those very optimistic revenue goals are not being hit. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, NHPR's Robert Grove, I want to bring you into the conversation because you you've been witness to how this debate unfolded to some extent. So, what what was the dynamic in the chamber? Is 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 it a change to Democratic leadership that sort of caused this change in the the approach to funding full day kindergarten? I don't think so because the the vote was was unanimous, um, and uh, I mean the dynamic in the chamber you talk about was there wasn't it wasn't very dynamic. Uh, it was pretty just the facts. Um, people got to it pretty quickly. Um, you had both Democrats uh, and Republicans sort of getting out in front of it and and supporting it. Mm-hmm. And did lawmakers sort of have in mind the fact that um, Kino hasn't been making enough money? Is that sort of what what drove this change? I, I think you could probably say that um, uh, re- Senate Republican uh, leader Chuck Morse um, said that he, he never really liked Keno uh, in the first place. He just did it to get it into the budget, um, um, you know, but but supported uh, full day kindergarten nonetheless. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, listeners, uh, please give us your thoughts. We'd love to hear from you. This is the weekly New Hampshire News Roundup. Uh, we're going to talk about legislative efforts to raise the minimum wage in just a moment. Uh, what do you think? Is it a bad idea? Good idea? 
If you're a business owner, tell us, how's it going to affect you if you are paying your employees minimum wage and, and you suddenly have to pay them more or you have to pay them more on a, on a schedule, uh, according to the legislature, if this bill uh, is signed into law? Uh, our phone number, 1-800-892-6477. You can also email exchange at nhpr.org. Before we get to the minimum wage thing, though, I want to talk about the red flag laws, uh, the red flag law that, that we talked about last week. Uh, the the bill which would have enabled family members of law enforcement to petition a court to remove someone's firearms if they're deemed potentially dangerous to themselves or others. It was tabled uh, by a legislative committee this week. Um, as with many pieces of gun legislation in Concord, this one was pretty contentious. Robert, can you tell us a, a little bit about this debate and how, how lawmakers reached the conclusion that they did? Yeah, so at, at the hearing um, a few weeks ago, uh, there were a number of concerns uh, raised uh, by groups uh, like the ACLU, um, uh, Association of uh, Criminal Defense Lawyers. Uh, they essentially raised questions about uh, due process. Um, you know, uh, they questioned whether or not uh, standards for evidence um, were uh, strict enough uh, in the bill. So there was there was that sort of side of it. Um, a lot of, uh, well, at least one gun rights group um you know, invoked a sci-fi term in, in calling it a pre-crime, uh, you know, that, that you would be taking, you know, restricting people's rights before uh, they've committed a crime. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they may commit some crime and we're going to restrict these rights anyways. Um, so those were two sort of uh, sides of this. Um, uh, going into it, um, you know, I, I talked with uh, the uh, the prime sponsor on the bill, um, Deborah Altshuller, uh, she said she, they couldn't get that quite right, um, and that's why you got uh, earlier this week um, uh, uh, the unanimous vote to, to essentially um, kill the bill, uh, retain it, uh, work on it more. Mm -hmm. So, so, so they are going to work on it more. Or is it just going to die a quiet death? That's what she. That's what she said. Um, she said that they were going to work on it more over the summer, um, but essentially for right now, it's it's not going anywhere. Okay. And so, are are there other gun related bills uh, in the works right now? And if so, what are they? How are they faring? There was a House bill um, that that passed. Uh, let's see, it was last late last month um, that would uh, um, uh, restrict uh, firearms in school zones, uh, so school property, and I believe things like uh, school buses, and things like that. Um, it cleared the House uh, along party lines, um, so that one's uh, moving ahead for now. Mm -hmm. uh, listeners, give us a call if you have questions or comments about the week's news. One eight hundred eight nine two. 6477. Worth mentioning, too, that the exchange plans to discuss a bill that addresses the background check system in an upcoming show. Uh, if you have questions or comments or a story to tell about that, send an email now. Uh, the address is exchange at nhpr.org. Also this week, the House and Senate moved forward on a $12 per hour minimum wage in New Hampshire. Uh, New Hampshire currently uses the federal minimum of $7.25 an hour. So let's let's drill down into the details of this list legislation. Trent, I'll go to you. Uh, uh, this $12 an hour um, minimum wage under this under both of these pieces of legislation in the House and Senate, it would be graduated, right? It wouldn't be instant. It wouldn't be instant. It would be. It, it's a little complicated. So it would move. The, it would change the the uh, minimum wage to, or it would, it would create a state minimum wage, which would be twelve dollars an hour, like you said, uh, and it would um, it would potentially uh, make the tipped wage. So if you work in a restaurant or something, um, right now the tipped wage is three twenty six an hour, which is fairly common. That's not unique to New Hampshire, right? It's not unique to New Hampshire. It's it's very common throughout the country because you you could theoret you will theoretically get tips. Um, what this bill would do is um, could move it to up to six dollars an hour, and then if you are an employee and you don't make twelve dollars an hour after those tips, the business owner would have to step in and and pay the difference. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of restaurants wanted that. They thought that if you moved the entire minimum wage up for everyone, that actually everything would kind of be out of whack, and they would have to uh, pay more money to people who who are working at the front. The other thing that we've heard f f that we've heard. Uh, doing reporting about this is that there are very few people making the actual minimum wage, which is seven twenty-five. Mm -hmm. It's almost impossible to hire someone in New Hampshire at seven twenty-five right now because of all the workforce issues we're having. New Hampshire's tied for the lowest unemployment in the country, uh, and so many people are making about twelve dollars an hour right now. The question just is whether the legislature uh, has the political might to to actually codify that, which it seems like. It, that would be possible given the democratic control. And then wh whether the governor, who don't forget used to be a business owner uh, in his own right, paying people uh, you know, kind of in that range, uh, whether he would sign that into law. 
Dean, your, your yeah, thoughts? That's very interesting. You know, minimum wage has been a litmus test issue between Republicans and Democrats pretty much for as long as I can remember at this point. Uh, it is popular among voters in states where they've put it to a, a, a vote, a referendum. Uh, it's typically supported. We've seen a number of cities increase their minimum wage. Uh, you know, here in New Hampshire, Governor Sununu uh, does not support it. I recall the, the day after the midterm, we were doing a, an election wrap up on the exchange and he called in and Laura Canoy asked him if he would support a minimum wage and he had a very quick answer. He said, now why would I do that? And mm -hmm. his argument was that uh, it would be, a, as you hear from most Republicans, that it would be a drag on uh, the economy. And they also make the argument that Trent just mentioned that no one, no one's making seven twenty-five anyway because of the the lab, labor, uh, tight labor market in the state. You're getting paid more anyway. But uh, this is just one of those things where Republicans and Democrats just are, are consistently divided. Uh, and 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 whether or not we move on this, and it would step up, I think nine, ten, twelve over three years to twenty twenty-one. Really, just depends on the, having the right numbers in the in the legislature and, and a Democratic governor who would sign it, because Sununu would not sign a, a minimum wage increase. Mm -hmm. So, what about the chances for a veto override? Is this something Democrats would want to want to attempt? Uh, Could they? Per attempt? Perhaps <laughs> I don't know that the numbers are there though for it. Trends. Yeah. That's a good question. Good. Yeah. Open yeah. question. Not sure. Yeah, they would need a Certainly number try. of Republicans to right. to, and it, it would be unclear. It, yeah. Okay. Uh, this is the weekly New Hampshire News Roundup on The Exchange on NHPR. I'm Peter Biello, and still to come, presidential candidates are making plans to visit New Hampshire. What are you hoping to hear from them? Are you going to go see someone? Maybe Elizabeth Warren's going to be here today, for example, uh, but there are many others. What, what issues are first and foremost on your mind? We want to hear from you. Join this conversation. The number is 1-800-892-6477. Email exchange at nhpr.org or post on our Facebook page at NHPR Exchange. We've got a live video of this radio program streaming now. This is The Roundup. I'm Peter Biello. We'll be right back. M. From Tarm Biomass in Orford, providing renewable, reliable, automated wood heat in New Hampshire homes and businesses, discovering green innovations and staying warm. Woodboilers.com. Mostly cloudy for today, chance of some rain showers, high temperatures in the 50s. It'll be mostly cloudy, chance of evening rain showers, lows tonight in the 30s. Tomorrow, mostly sunny, most of the day, mostly cloudy, rain and snow showers in the north country, highs tomorrow in the lower 40s. On Monday on The Exchange, we'll be talking with NPR senior editor Ron Elving for a national perspective on the Democratic Party and the many candidates for president. Right now, we're taking a fresh look at the events of the past week on the weekly New Hampshire News Roundup. In the studio with me are Dean Spiliotis, civic scholar in the School of Arts and Sciences at SNHU and author of the website NH Political Capital, Trent Spinner, executive editor for the Union Leader and New Hampshire Sunday News, and Paul Steinhauser. New Hampshire political reporter for the Concord Monitor, Seacoast Online, and nationally for Fox News. Paul, thanks very much for joining us. Great to be here, guys. So uh, since you're here, Paul, let's talk 2020. Uh, and let's start with the Senate before we get to the presidential candidates. Uh, a few polls have, have looked at how strong a challenger Governor Sununu might be if he decided to run for the U.S. Senate in 2020 uh, uh, against uh, Democrat Gene Shaheen. Polls show the race would be pretty tight. Uh, so what do you make of this, Paul? Well, the governor made a little bit of news this week for the first time because he's been telling uh, the union leader, he's been telling the Concord Mind, he's been telling everybody over the last year or two that he has no interest in going to Washington, that he's an executive, that he wouldn't fit in in, in the state sen in, in the Senate, in the U.S. Senate. Change that language a little bit this week, right? He opened the door a little bit by saying he's not ruling anything out. He made those comments um, uh, on a radio station, and then later that day on Wednesday, uh, he had a, a, a question and answer session with reporters, including myself, Adam Sexton from the uh, from WMUR, and Dave Solomon from the Union Leader. And we asked him about a the polls and b mm -hmm. whether you know he was considering this. And he definitely kept the door open, saying he's not ruling anything out. He's got no timetable. Of course, it's going to any kind of decision would come after the session's over and the budget is signed. See and delivered. He also talked about those polls that you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. And he said they indicate that Gene Shaheen is, quote unquote, very vulnerable. So 
Uh, a little bit of intrigue now that we didn't think we had, but uh, I, I think national Republicans, I've spoken to a few, they would love for Governor Sununu to run for the Senate. They feel that, you know, other than Kelly Ayotte, who does not seem to indicate any interest in running in 20, that Sununu may be the only person who could give Shaheen a run for the money in that election. And, and one of the things uh, reported was that uh, Sununu suggested uh, Jean Shaheen announcing so early was a sign that she's aware of of how uh, perilous that she she might be. I, I don't know. What do you think of that, Dean? Uh, well, it, it is true. As as Paul said, he has certainly changed his tone. I recall the, the comments about being a manager and not wanting another job. And uh, certainly the, 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 com- the more recent comments about uh, not uh, – not foreclosing any options was a, was a change in tone. Uh, my guess is he's probably still leaning towards uh, running for governor rather than senator. You know, Jean Shaheen, when she ran uh, won re-election in 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 uh, 2014, uh, that was a, a bad year for Democrats. They lost control of the U.S. Senate. She was one of the few bright spots for Democrats uh, uh, in that midterm election. Uh, it's a presidential year. Presidential years tend to be better for Democrats than midterms. I think that would help her a little bit. Uh, you know, her approval is still good, not as high as, as Governor Sununu's, obviously. Um, but uh, it would be an interesting race. I'm, I'm still skeptical it's going to happen. Um, but it may be that this polling, these couple of polls that came out uh, got uh, Governor Sununu thinking or others, some maybe in the National Party are kind of whispering in his ear a little bit. And usually when uh, when 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 politicians say they're not thinking about it, they're they're probably thinking about it. That doesn't mean he'll do it, but uh, my guess is he's probably thinking about it more actively than he would he would care to admit. Okay, what do you think, Trent? I think everyone, especially uh, us in the media, we always go for the big headline, right? Mm. Tie in the poll, Governor Sununu, Gene Shaheen. Um, but if you dig into it, and this is why we actually didn't put on the front page. If you dig into it. What the poll really said was that the vast majority of voters have no idea who they're going to vote for. They are completely undecided. It is very early. Um, and so one of the things uh, that that we'll be looking for is how much support really is there. Um, and, I, and I get the top line of the poll. Uh, the other thing is Kelly Ayotte, I don't think, has fully stepped out of the of uh, being a potential candidate. I think in the last month, I've personally seen her at three different events. Um, so she's trying to keep a, a high profile in the state, which certainly would signal um, that there was, uh, that there's some interest there. And the last thing with Kelly Ayotte, whether kind of deciding whether or not she, she um, would run is don't forget she served with Shaheen in the Senate at the same time. And they didn't necessarily get along. I think there was some. Uh, there was. A, it was. A, it could be contentious at some points. Yeah. Uh, and so I wonder if Ayat would want to challenge Shaheen, um, kind of on a personal level. You know, yeah. guys. I, I and I, Trent. I love you, but I just don't see any way, shape, or form Kelly Ayat running. In 2020, if Donald Trump is on the ticket, there's a lot of history right. there. Hmm. I think it's much more likely that she goes in 2022 if she has an interest. She's got a great life right now, by the way. I don't know why you'd want to even get back. What, what is she doing now? She's on a lot of boards. She's making a good amount of money, and she's very active, as, as Trent said. I think it's more likely she goes in 2022 if she does it again, the rematch with Hassan. She only lost by, what, around 1,000 votes. Hmm. Um so uh, one other thing about Shaheen, too. Uh, listen, we are getting a little excited about this because it was a change. It was a change of stance from Sununu. That's what made it interesting. The polls, polls change every five seconds, right? So uh, enough with the polls. Uh, but Shaheen's going to be tough to beat. A, she's going to raise a boatload of money. She's a popular senator. He's a very popular governor, but she's a popular senator. He's had issues raising money. He didn't raise as much money as we thought he would in the 16 and especially in the 18 reelect. So if he is going to do this, and that's a huge if still, I, I agree with you guys, uh, he's going to have to step it up when it comes to fundraising. Yeah. You, is that what you're going to say, Dean? Yeah, that- yeah exactly. Paul's right on, right on point there. The issue, I think one of the issues for Kelly Ayotte is remember how incredibly uncomfortable she was running with uh, with President Trump at the top of the ticket the last time. Uh, and to, to subject herself to that again, which is what would happen should she run for the U.S. Senate, uh, I think is probably something she... She would want to avoid, particularly if she could she could uh, try again a, a couple years later uh, under a different set of circumstances at a midterm when you're likely to have a, a stronger, uh, you know, less Democratic turnout and 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 a, a perhaps an advantage for for Republicans. You know, one other potential theoretical complication is we're again I don't think he's going to, but we're Sununu to run for Senate that opens up the governorship. Maybe Kelly Ayotte would run for governor. Who knows? And on the Trump thing, don't forget that was very awkward at that time. That yeah. video had just come out. 
Uh, she was asked in a debate, do you think Donald Trump is a role model? She said Almost yes. Almost on a weekly basis, she was pressed on this stuff. She was pressed. And, and I, I don't think that she had the time. Don't forget the, the compressed timeline of all of that happening. The video comes out. She's in the de- that debate. She says that he is a role model. Then, um, you know, then she has to kind of walk that back. It's right before the election. And she does lose by 1,700 votes. So I wonder if now that she's had four years to kind of see how the Trump administration works, if she has a more nuanced uh, – uh, answer to the to the Trump question. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, let's talk about the presidential challengers, the possible possible presidential challengers to President Trump. And one uh, newly entered candidate is former Texas Congressman uh, Democrat Beto O'Rourke. He declared his candidacy. Uh, Paul, this is something many folks who were excited about his Senate campaign against Republican Ted Cruz were were hoping for, and there was there was at least some contingent of the draft Beto folks in in New Hampshire, so they must be pretty pleased by this. Uh, what kind of message is Beto O'Rourke sending as 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 he launches his campaign officially, Paul? They're they're very excited here in the Granite State. Those who are Beto supporters, I was at that house party in Concord back in January, and a very cold night on a school night, and it was packed. Jay Sertikowski, the Concord attorney, uh, who's kind of the top Beto supporter in this. I spoke to him yesterday, and he's thrilled. He uh, is hoping to see Beto here quite soon. Listen, O'Rourke was... Nobody knew O'Rourke outside of his d- district in El Paso, Texas. He became a Democratic celebrity, so much so that he's named only by his first name, kind of like Bernie, right? It's Bernie, it's Beto. Uh, why? Because he raised uh, eye-popping $80 million and came so close to upsetting uh, conservative Senator Ted Cruz. And then, of course, we had that Beto mania back in December and January. They're still there to some degree. He had a pretty good first day in Iowa. We'll see him here soon. I spoke to his campaign. They are not pinpointing when, but we will see Beto here soon. Uh, again, listeners, what issues do you want to hear the presidential candidates talk about? Where do you want them to fall on those issues as well? Let us know. We're going to be talking about 2020 for a little while yet. The number is 1-800-892-6477. Can I ask uh, you, Dean, and then you, Trent, your thoughts on Beto O'Rourke's candidacy? Yeah, I mean, the big question for me is, can he scale up to a national campaign? That that Texas run, as Paul mentioned, uh, you know, he, he says he did it without any kind of uh, polling, and he raised $80 million, and you know, had a little bit of that lightning in a bottle feel, even though he still lost, I think, by a little under 3% uh, to Ted Cruz. Uh, it had a kind of, a lot of people who were there said it had a very special kind of almost transcendent feel to it. And they're thinking was, could he bring this out onto a national stage? I, I don't know. Um, he doesn't strike me as the, I've, I've watched him a number of times now, uh, doesn't strike me as the most disciplined candidate, uh, needs to kind of figure out a little bit more what his policy uh, platform is going to be. But in some sense, he's running as Beto. I mean, it's the, 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 the personality, the leadership, the charisma is the thing for him. And that's not unusual for uh, for successful presidential candidates to do that. So, uh, I, you know, that's, that, that's something to continue to watch. It's just, it, it's, it, it, I found it amusing that, you know, I've watched him a number of times and I'm, I, I personally, in terms of visuals for campaigns, I find the intense hand gesticulating very distracting. Huh. And so I was amused yesterday to see that that was the first thing that President Trump went to in criticizing Beto saying, you know, well, he's moving his hands so much, it looks like, is he crazy or is that just who he is? And so uh, there's some, there's a little bit of grain of truth to that in terms of, uh, you know, how you present yourself visually on the stump. Some people like that. I, I find it distracting. Uh, we'll see uh, see what he does going what forward. What did but, you mean when you say he's not disciplined as a candidate? In, in terms of, you know, kind of having a, 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 strategy a strategy and a set of tactics that are well thought out that are systematic that you 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 scale out to a variety of different states you know his his campaign in texas and and all the social media hey you know here i am pumping gas i'm getting my teeth cleaned uh i'm not sure what i'm going to do you know had a little bit of the uh, you know a, a, a little bit of kind of the the introspective feel that he's trying to kind of figure his life out i mean all that stuff some people find that charming um but when you're in a big field with you know 15 candidates uh, you you got to find a way to break through. And so there's no denying. Everybody who's seen him says he has this kind of innate charisma. Uh, they compare him to Obama. Uh, mm. he, in my estimation, he's not there yet. Maybe he'll get there. Um, but that seems to be his strong suit. The, ba- the Beto visit reminds me of the age-old New Hampshire primary joke where the politician goes up to somebody and says, hey, are you voting for me? And they say, well, I don't know. You haven't been to my living room three times yet. <laughs> so this is Beto's first trip to New Hampshire. And what we'll be looking for is how much, how many, given the number of candidates on the Democratic side, how many people are really interested in meeting the candidates versus how much charisma can play a role in this election. What we saw in the last primary was that Hillary Clinton was a well-known commodity 
in New Hampshire. She had been here. She had friends here. Uh, and she was unseated in New Hampshire by almost 20, I think it's 22, 24 points by Bernie Sanders, who didn't have a ton of connections here. And then on the Republican side in the last primary, Donald Trump didn't, did, I think, did one town hall. He didn't go to anyone's living room. And he uh, blew out the competition here in New Hampshire just based on his popularity. Uh, so I wonder if somebody like Beto, who we heard from our friend Jay Serkowski, has this incredible uh, charisma, if that will do it, if that, given the number of candidates, if that will be enough in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. Paul? Trump did one living room. The first trip, though, and then after that, he didn't. That was one Steve, red arrow. Steve I saw him in a red arrow. I saw oh, him sit in a red arrow that. booth once. And Steve Stepanak was now the party chair here. He did that one when he first came. Uh, <laughs> let's talk about New Hampshire, though, a little bit more because, you know, a lot of – every four years, some political reporters write the obituary for the New Hampshire First Nation primary, right? Mm -hmm. Happens every – not here in New Hampshire, outside the state reporters. Uh, we've got eight – no, we've got nine either presidential declared candidates or potential contenders in the state today through Monday. New Hampshire primary is doing okay. I know there was a lot of gloom and doom that uh, because of California and the early voting that will start actually before we go to our ballot, uh, that, that we wouldn't be, we wouldn't matter anymore. We, we still matter this time around. We'll see what happens in the 24 and 28 cycles, but so, for, so far in the 20 cycle, New Hampshire matters. We're seeing a ton of traffic and uh, just weekend alone. Yeah, as we are sitting here right now, Cory Booker is at the Salt Hill Pub up in Lebanon. We've got two other senators coming this weekend, a governor. We got Cong it, it, It's a full slate. Trent. We should just get on the record that Paul Steinhauser was a big time Washington, D.C. reporter <laughs> at CNN, and he never wrote New Hampshire's obituary. So thank, thank you. For, you thank you, Paul. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> High fives all around in the studio. OK, well, uh, it, uh, uh, New Hampshire seems to matter very much to uh, Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren. She's coming to New Hampshire today. Uh, she made news this week because she was uh, running ads on Facebook calling for the breakup of Facebook. And then Facebook took that down, citing uh, Facebook's standard advertising policy. And some say in doing so, Facebook was sort of proving Elizabeth Warren's point that Facebook is too big and too powerful. Um, that seems like at least one of the messages that she's betting is going to be big for her, Paul. What, what other messages uh, is she carrying to New Hampshire? Here's the thing about Warren. People, and, and, hey, yes, war, this is a must-win state for Warren. Okay, let's, we, we all say that. It's a must-win for Bernie. It's a must-win for Warren. She Give her credit for this. She's not soaring in the polls right now, but she really is the ideas candidate in this race uh, here in New Hampshire and nationally. Uh, and this is just the latest example. Remember when she came and headlined the New Hampshire Democratic Party's major f uh, fundraising dinner, uh, that gala last month. She uh, laid out uh, her plan for universal pre-K and for child care. She has really been feeding this race with some smart uh, ideas. Some people will disagree with them. A lot of people will disagree with them. But I got to give her credit for being the ideas candidate. Mm -hmm. uh, let me ask you about um, another uh, politician from Massachusetts, Democratic Congressman Seth Moulton. We haven't talked about him yet on this program. Mm -hmm. And so Paul, I'm hoping you could sort of fill us in on, on who he is. He hasn't declared yet, but people are saying, eh, maybe Seth Moulton. I know he's a he's a Marine Corps veteran, isn't he? Yep. Served four or five tours in Iraq. I'm not sure of which one. Uh, listen, he's well, kind of kind of known here because his district is right over the border. Yeah, it's, it's in close. the north, uh, north Shore, northeast part of the, uh, Massachusetts. He is definitely seriously flirting with the idea of running for president. He's coming back here this weekend to New Hampshire. He was just here uh, a few weeks back. He was here last fall. He's been to some of the other early voting states in the primary and caucus calendar. Uh, he has not ruled it out. He's definitely seriously thinking about it. One thing that could hurt him here, though, remember last year in that wild primary in the first congressional district in New Hampshire, he backed his fellow Marine, Morris Sullivan, who came in second but lost to Chris Pappas. And I think that rubs some people the wrong way. But he's definitely considering it. He's back in the state this weekend. Trent? I've never met Seth Moulton, but I did hire his brother to be a reporter at the Union Leader. How'd that go? It was great. He said that his <laughs> parents instilled uh, a, ve a very strong work ethic, and he was a great reporter for us. Uh, he, he left the state because he said, if my brother runs for president, I don't want to be here. <laughs> <laughs> but he was a great reporter, very hardworking. And so uh, I would imagine after watching his brother's career that uh, they have similar ethics. And, and Seth Moulton is not the only one who's flirting with the White House who's coming to New Hampshire this weekend. Bill de Blasio, New York City mayor, he'll be here this weekend as well, including a stop in Concord at the Common Man on Sunday. Uh, he's another one who is uh, now making the rounds in the early voting states and coming. You know, he was in South Carolina just the other day, in Iowa last month, now here. So uh, the field is at 15 right now. That's declared candidates and those who've set up exploratory committees. 
Uh, I think it's all but clear that Joe Biden is getting in the race. It's all but clear that Eric Swalwell, who's been here a couple of times, mm -hmm. is getting in the race. We could get up to about 20 when we're all said and done. I was going to ask you about Joe Biden. So so um, where how um, I guess how optimistic are his can campaign folks? I guess you couldn't call him campaign folks yet because he hasn't declared. But he gave the biggest hint yet this week. Earlier in this week, he was in Washington, D.C. at the International Association of Firefighters, a union that he has strong support with and long ties. And he made his hints all but clear that he would be getting in. My source and if you look at the reporting from the, uh, from other nationals as well, it, it'll probably be an early April launch for the uh, for the vi former vice president. Is that too late? Not for him. There are a few people who could who could wait that long because he's got the name ID, right? Everybody mm -hmm. knows Joe Biden. If you look at all the polls, and again, take him with a lot of grains of salt right now, but he's at the top of every poll nationally and pretty much uh, in the early voting states. Yeah, he can wait a little bit and, and still get in given his his particular set of circumstances. It's interesting you mentioned Bill de Blasio. Uh, he's, de Blasio has always been a polarizing figure in the Democratic Party. Uh, he was supposed to be up here for a visit several weeks ago and it was canceled, but I, that morning of his, his scheduled visit, I opened up the Concord Monitor and there was a full page ad from one of the unions. I can't remember which union saying, let us tell you about the real Bill de Blasio. And it was just a litany of, of criticisms of de Blasio. So if he were to get in, uh, I, I think he would continue to be a little bit polarizing. I'm not convinced he's going to get in. Uh, and on uh, Seth Moulton, the, the, the Maura Sullivan endorsement really did uh, rub a lot of Democrats in the first uh, district uh, the wrong way. It, did, it just kind of showed a lack of kind of the, the, uh, the dynamics of that race on the ground in New Hampshire. I understand the military connection, um, but uh, it's something he's going to have to explain if uh, Democrats are going to want to understand that better uh, if he comes up here. But they, and, I, and I, I'm glad you brought that up, and I did as, as well earlier, but they're not shunning him, though, which is interesting, because one of the stops he has this weekend will be in Summersworth at the Teetoller Cafe. Cafe, which has become a must stop for Democrats. Uh, who's hosting that? The New Hampshire Young Democrats. So I think that's a signal that, yeah, he burned some bridges last year, but he didn't totally burn every bridge. And the Young Democrats thing is interesting because if you look at the ages of the candidates, Joe Biden is 76, Bernie Sanders 77, mm -hmm. uh, Elizabeth Warren, Warren is turning 70. Mm -hmm. And then you have these people in their 40s. Uh, uh, in 30s, Pete Buttigieg. 30s, right, 30s, exactly. 40 years 37. younger than Bernie Sanders. Small exactly. Wells in his 30s. Yep, Seth Moulton is 40. Mm -hmm. Beto is uh, in, in his, in his mid-40s. I believe, yeah. So I wonder if that if that age difference, right, it will, will, uh, will make a difference for voters or if people are looking for an experienced person who has been around for a long time or whether people are looking for a fresh face in the Democratic Party. Yeah, you know, it's a great storyline, and we've all – talked about it over the last couple of months. Uh, you, when you ask voters, they, they're very diplomatic about it. You know, we don't need a young candidate per se, but we need somebody with young ideas. That's mm. kind of the diplomatic way of saying, well, very old, but maybe not too old. Okay. Well, uh, a few more questions on 2020. Uh, I, maybe just this last one, Paul. I'll, I'll ask you, like, uh, are there any potential challengers to President Trump on the Republican side? I mean, former Governor John Kasich, uh, He's been calling for Republicans to put country over party. What, what do you think? Are, is anybody going to step up and challenge the president in his own party? As we are doing this show right now, down in Nashua, Bill Well, the former Massachusetts governor who came here a month ago and said that he was exploring a uh, primary challenge to the president, he is uh, one of the speakers at that uh, annual Wild Irish Rose, uh, Roast. So, yes, mm. he's very much thinking about it. He's been here every week since he made that announcement of politics and eggs. Okay. But the big news this past week was that Larry Hogan, the Maryland governor, Right. So Republican mm -hmm. two-term governor in a very blue state will be coming up to New Hampshire on April 23rd and headlining politics and eggs. So that's a clear signal that he's seriously thinking about it. And, of course, there's Kasich. But, again, whoever does it right now, at least, would be an extreme long shot against the president. And the other thing, the other caveat is it's not going to happen now. If there is a primary challenge, that announcement is probably going to come later in the year. Well, uh, Paul Steinhauser, thank you very much for being here this part of the program. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Peter. See you Paul guys. Steinhauser, uh, New Hampshire political reporter for the Concord Monitor, Seacoast Online, and nationally for Fox News. We've got links to his writing, uh, his reports at our website, nhpr.org. Uh, still to come on the weekly New Hampshire News Roundup, this is Sunshine Week, which is a time to celebrate the beauty of open records laws. It doesn't take a journalist to appreciate these laws, but journalists can and do request documents from the government that are presumed to be public but aren't readily available. And sometimes it's a struggle to get these documents, but often it is worth it. The number to call, 1-800-892-6477. If you've got questions about the week's news or if you if you have a particular Sunshine Week story that you'd like to bring to our attention, you can also email exchange at nhpr.org or post on our Facebook page at NHPR Exchange. This is the Weekly New Hampshire News Roundup. I'm Peter Biello. We'll be right back.
Boeing grounded. But on what grounds? The FAA makes safety decisions, period. 737 is also the number of inmates on California's death row, but the governor has news for them. And is the country ready for another president from Texas? Beto O'Rourke joins the Democratic race. The Friday News Roundup next time on 1A. That's this morning at 10 here on NHPR. Support for NHPR comes from you, our listeners, and from Land Rover Bedford with a brand new showroom and state of the art service center at 404 South River Road. Service appointments available at LandRoverBedford.com. Mostly cloudy for today, chance of rain showers and windy high temperatures in the 50s. It'll be mostly cloudy, a chance of evening rain showers, lows tonight in the 30s. And for tomorrow, mostly sunny most of the day, mostly cloudy, some rain and snow showers for the North Country, highs tomorrow in the lower 40s. This is the weekly New Hampshire News Roundup on The Exchange on NHPR. I'm Peter Biello here in the studio with Dean Spiliotis, civic scholar in the School of Arts and Sciences at SNHU, and Trent Spinner, executive editor for the Union Leader and New Hampshire Sunday News. We're talking about the week's news, and we'd love to hear from you. Our phone number, one 800 892 Six four seven seven, or you can email exchange at nhpr.org. Following up on our conversation about the 2020 primary, uh, Gary wrote in to say, I am looking for a presidential candidate who's going to fight for the planet and put into place policies that address the real crisis of global warming and the threat that CO2 and methane are bringing to our planet. We need a Marshall Plan to transition us off fossil fuels. Thanks very much, Gary. We appreciate your thought. Uh, in this part of the program, we wanted to give a nod to Sunshine Week. For journalists and fans of the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, Sunshine, Sunshine Week is a time to appreciate the efforts journalists and others make to bring important stories to light using public records laws. Uh, with New Hampshire's Right to Know Law, the Federal Freedom of Information Act, citizens, not just journalists, can request emails, data, other public documents from the government, though sometimes there is a cost associated with that disclosure. Uh, and for this part of the conversation, we'll, we'll bring in Jonathan Van Fleet, Managing Editor of the Concord Monitor. Jonathan, thank you very much for being with us today. Thanks, Peter. So, uh, Jonathan, reporters at the Concord Monitor have written stories using open records laws. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the nature of the records available to New Hampshire, because as as your reporters have, have written in the Monitor, it might be easier to find uh, a letter from New Hampshire's first governor in the 18th century than it may be to, say, find uh, emails recently written by a, by, a, by a recently retired state employee, which may be pertinent to a story. So I'm wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about what is and maybe what isn't available. Sure. Well, um, as with any law, it's open to interpretation. The right to know law offers the public the greatest possible access. And that's the way we look at it. And um, not everyone sees the greatest possible access in the same way. Uh, There's a lot of exemptions there. And so we fight uh, to get access to the records. But I'd like to say that we're not alone. The union leader does a lot of great work on this sort of stuff as well. Um, They've done a lot of reporting on city salaries in in Manchester and teacher absences, a lot of the the hard uh, in the trenches work that uh, we've been doing this week for Sunshine Week. And And we do it basically to inform people. It's not necessarily gotcha journalism as mm-hmm. much as it is um, showing what records are available, giving people information, allowing them to uh, talk to their elected officials if they care about these matters. Yeah. And uh, what you published in the Concord Monitor uh, recently uh, was a, a list of uh, salary, salary mm-hmm. data mm-hmm. for uh, city employees from from town manager all the way down the list. Mm-hmm. And what do you think is the value in, in finding that information through an open records request and publishing it in the Concord Monitor? Well, by looking at the spreadsheet of, of salaries, you can do several types of analysis. For example, uh, we looked at the number of women in the top paying jobs in the city of Concord, and there were none in the top 25 earners. And um, that, that stood out to us. So that's what we kind of led the story with. There are, all, are also some the, – the eye goes to the top of the list, but I think the list is valuable lower down as well. For example, if uh, you look at the school side and you can see that a woman who works with a special needs student makes $17,000 a year and a guy who mows the grass at Beaver Meadow Golf Course makes $60,000 a year, then the public – 
can say whether they choose to or not, I like this, I don't like this. And so it's not necessarily trying to um, say this is good or bad, but give people the information. So if they want that, that teacher aid to get a raise, they can then go to the school board and say, we think this person deserves a higher wage for their work. In other words, the sunshine is supposed to disinfect whatever might need to be disinfected, in other words. <laughs> That's a, that is absolutely one way to put it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Trent, Trent your, your thoughts on the open records laws, because the union leader uses them fairly frequently. So um, just to take off my reporter hat for a second mm-hmm. and, and put on my uh, Concord resident and Concord monitor subscriber hat for a minute, what stuck out to me in, in the list were the number of people who were making forty or $50,000 a year in overtime. Hmm. And as a resident of Concord, um, you know, these are police officers and, and firefighters who we have a lot of respect for, and we, we know that the work that they do is incredibly important to our community. But I just wonder if you, there was one police officer who made $55,000 in overtime, and I wonder what does that mean for their health? What does that mean for, for staffing? Are we correctly staffing our police department? Um, and for me, that was something that I was concerned about because if you are having an emergency and you're calling a police officer who has been on duty for 20 hours, uh, is that safe? And so that's something that I think was really important in, in what the monitor did this week. Uh, I also think seeing that the city manager makes $200,000 a year, which I have all kinds of respect. I know he's worked really hard and has made big differences for the city, but I as a taxpayer, feel like knowing how much money he makes, I can call him and complain about the pothole outside of my house. Mm -hmm. Um, So at the union leader, we do several hundred right to know requests. We do about one a day, Um, whether that's a right to know request or unsealing uh, court records. We like to make the joke in the newsroom that every week is sunshine week at the union leader. Um, It is incredibly important. The the right to know law is incredibly important to just, as you said, disinfect um, uh, things that that maybe people don't know about. Mm -hmm. Um, We wrote a story about uh, teacher absences. We wrote a story about a series of stories about what was called a chief day uh, at the Manchester Police Department where police officers were getting days off in exchange for volunteering at road races. Um, And so without the right to know law, the public would never have that information. Mm -hmm. Dean, do you want to come Actually, a a question I'm interested to hear from both of you, your sense of how well and how efficient this process works in New Hampshire. You know, is it is it a situation where you may, uh, b- because the process takes a while, you have to write stories and then go, go back and add in uh, follow up once you get these documents, or is it really a document by document request situation? I guess give listeners a sense of sort of how easy is this to do, or is this a constant struggle? It depends. In, for me, it depends on who you ask. Uh, certain certain groups are, are very forthcoming with information, and you have a track record with them. And so when you ask for information and records, there is a willingness to provide it. And then there's others that that don't agree, and, and they will stall. And, uh, you know, that's when a legal fight may be necessary. And it is not a, a big secret that newspaper legal budgets are not what they used to be. And we're, we're often going up against a, a staff attorney who can uh, litigate this case indefinitely. And so there are stall tactics that can be employed. There's a lot of exemptions within the law. And uh, an interesting thing about the law is sometimes there you can argue that the public interest in the records that you seek outweighs the exemption. And that's a, that is usually done at a judicial level. Sometimes you can successfully argue it with the person that you're asking the records of. Um, but th- those are the, those are the fights that happen all the time. And to answer your question, I kind of think of it like a, a boomerang. And a good reporter should have multiple boomerangs out there at the same time. And they'll come back, and when they do, you write about them. And if they don't, you can write about the fact on Sunshine Week that you're having a hard time getting your information. Mm-hmm. It is a constant battle. Um, and let me share some horror stories with you. Last year, when we went to get the Manchester City salaries, the uh, the city government actually had our reporter uh, drive down to City Hall, pay thirteen dollars, and then they emailed us the list. It was a list that was a file just sitting on somebody's computer, and we had to drive over there and pay them cash so they could email it to us. Uh, we've had people say we won't do it. We won't fulfill your right to know request. Uh, unless you send it to us on official letterhead. Clearly not in the law. We have had people uh, say, 
um, we're, we're fighting a case with the attorney general's office right now. We're looking for just one file. And they said, uh, before we can send this to you, there's the, we may need to research this. It could potentially take uh, 30 days. So just a, there are some real horror stories out there about how the law is not working. But there is always recourse, right? You just have to push or perhaps spend some some legal resources to say, no, it it should not take you 30 days to, to reach into a file cabinet and pull out that file, right? You could say that? Absolutely. And we have a staff attorney who gets in. I talk to every single week who gets involved in a number of cases for us uh, where there's just egregious violations of the law. Of the, law. the law actually was just recently changed to personally hold people. Uh, so if you're like a town clerk and you are, you are knowingly violating violating the law, you can be held responsible personally for I think it's up to $3,000 in legal legal costs. Wow. And we think that that's an important improvement. We uh, are, are uh, pursuing cases like that because there are people who just uh, either don't understand the law or uh, feel like that's it's ba- it's information that would look their make their town look bad, mm. uh, and so they're going to they're going to not release it. That was that was going to be my next question. Like, to what extent is the resistance you're getting a product of ignorance of the law, or is it bad faith? We just don't want you to have it. I would say the bad faith is probably one percent. Really? The, yeah, one percent. The main thing that that has been an issue, and we have been working with groups like the Municipal Association to to understand what kind of training uh, these municipal employees are getting to make sure they just understand what the law is. Uh, there's been debate in the legislature about forcing people, if you, be, if you are a selectman or you're uh, voted onto the planning board or you're a municipal employee, that you need to, that there should be a mandatory training on the right to know law. Hmm. The Municipal Association has pushed push back on that, calling it an unfunded uh, uh, mandate. Uh, but they offer training. They offer training to their members. And we always encourage people to, to find those resources. Jonathan Van Fleet. I can, I can offer another example. Some people will ask us, the monitor, why do we just pick on Concord? Why do we just publish Concord salaries? Why not all of the other towns? In the you did look at some other towns, didn't you? We've done Merrimack Valley in the past, but Go back three, four years. We decided, you know, if that was a fair criticism. We want to, we want to create a, basically, a master database of all of the the municipal salaries in the capital region. And what we found was, many small towns didn't know how to export the data from their payroll system. They hmm. actually couldn't do it. And so then we went to their vendor, this that basically provides their human resources software, we figured out how to do it. We said, okay, well, just let us into your computer. Give us the spreadsheet. And they said, you can't do that. So Mm. there you go. Well, uh, Jonathan Van Fleet of the Concord Monitor, thanks very much for joining us in this part of the program. Really appreciate it. Well, happy to be here. Thank you. Thanks also to uh, Trent Spinner, uh, the New Hampshire Union leader, and Dean Spiliotis, civic scholar in the School of Arts and Sciences at SNHU. Really appreciate you being here for the whole show. It's been great. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Uh, And remember, we we provide links to all the stories that we've discussed at our website, nhpr.org, which is where part of the conversation continues. You can also chat about it on Facebook, NHPR Exchange. The Exchange is a production of New Hampshire Public Radio. The engineer is Dan Colgan. Our senior producer is Ellen Grimm. Michael Brindley is our program manager. Our producers are Jessica Hunt and Christina Phillips. Our public radio fellow is Ali Oshinsky. Uh, Rebecca Lavoie's work in the cameras and our theme music was composed by Bob Lord. I'm Peter Biello. Thank you very much for listening and have a great weekend. Thank you.